Hello again, my dear students. This is the second part of our video lecture on the rise of Nazism, chapter 3 of our lesson. We shall discuss the economic crisis, Hitler's rise to power, and the ideology of Nazism. By the end of this video lecture, I would like you to go through your textbook, page number 41 to 50. This episode is going to be focused on Germany after World War I is over and what's happening in the country. So as you go along, please be sure to take notes, especially anything that's in black or red, or anything that I might dictate over the slides. Feel free to pause if necessary or rewind. So, let's begin. World War I ends with the blame on Germany. Uh, the treaty that ends the war is called the Treaty of Versailles, which we talked about. And the treaty forced Germany to pay $33 billion in reparations. Remember the word reparations means war damages. Germany loses land and its colonies. And we are decreasing or reducing Germany's military. Okay, this is how the Treaty of Versailles affects Germany. So, a new government's going to be set up in Germany because they don't trust the old one that was in the war. And it's going to be a democratic government. The word democratic means uh, power to the people, basically. The people have control. The people can elect different officials or can vote on different things. So we're really giving power to the people with this new democratic government, and that's set up in Germany. The name of this new democratic government in Germany is called the Weimar Republic. Okay, the Weimar Republic. W is pronounced as a V, German, okay? So we have a new democratic government set up right after World War I in Germany. Switching in three, two, one, get the notes from a friend. So to pay off the reparations, the Weimar Republic had a horrible idea. They said, damn, 33 billion is a lot of money. Why don't we just print more money? This never works for the economy, just printing more money. The reason why it never works is because it causes something called inflation. The definition of inflation is when the prices of goods go up, but the value of the money goes down. Say that again. The prices of something that you want to buy goes crazy high, but your money, the worth of your money, decreases. I'll give you an example of inflation on the next slide because this is kind of a difficult thing to understand. So switching in three, two, one, get the notes by pausing and rewinding. So let's talk about the year 1914 and if you were in Germany you really want to buy these fancy pair of shoes. That's right, they're dope. Uh, it would cost you in 1914 about maybe 10 marks. Okay, marks is the German currency. Okay, not a bad deal. 10 marks for a pair of shoes. Cool, I got that. All right. However, the Weimar Republic begins to print more and more money and the value of these shoes goes up to 1,400 marks, same exact shoe, but later on in 1922, because we're printing out money, the value goes up to 1,400 marks, okay? But the value of one mark is the same. It's not like you automatically have tons more marks, no, okay? Marks are still worth the same. It's like a dollar is still worth the same amount, okay? Crazy expensive going from 10 to 14 marks. However, if we were to keep going just one more year later, from 1922 to 1923, what do you think is going to happen to the value of these beautiful, popping, lit, awesome sauce shoes? It's going to increase to 30 trillion marks. The same exact pair of shoes for an extraordinary price. This is inflation. The price of the goods go up, but you have like the same amount of money. You really only have 10 marks, okay? Your money's worthless basically at this point because you don't have $30 trillion worth of marks. The value of the goods go up, but the value of your money, the bills that you have goes down because it's not worth anymore. You don't have a wheelbarrow full of money, okay? In fact, 
the wheelbarrow is worth more than the actual money at this point. I'll explain it in the next slide. Okay, money became worthless in Germany at this point. Okay, thirty trillion dollars of marks can only buy you a pair of shoes. Imagine what everything else costs. Money is completely worthless. You have one person using money as wallpaper because they it can't buy them anything else. You have one person sweeping it into the gutter because they can't buy anything else. And children use stacks of monies as basically toys now because you couldn't use the money for anything else. In fact, we're talking about that wheelbarrow from before. If I had a wheelbarrow full of money to try and buy bread at the store, and if I were to get robbed, the thief would take the wheelbarrow instead of the actual money because the wheelbarrow is worth more than the money in Germany at the time. So never print off money. It leads to inflation. And that's what the Weimar Republic did. This is one of my favorite pictures to look at, actually. We see a woman over here burning German money because it's worthless at the point. So she's burning it in her fireplace to keep warm in her home. Remember, inflation, the value of goods is so high that you do not have enough money to buy those goods. So for her, it does better to just burn it in the fireplace and keep warm during the winter. German money was worthless at this time, and the country was horribly poor, and things are going to get even worse. So, over in the U.S. for a second, in our country in 1929, we're going through what's called a Great Depression, or it's basically a really poor time in the U.S. economy. Uh, what happened was our stock market crashed and it basically brought America to be extremely poor, decreases the U.S. economy. Because the U.S. is going to be a leading power at this time, a lot of people are going to be reliant on the U.S. economy. The, because the U.S. economy goes down, all countries across the world, their economies crash as well, including Germany. And Germany also goes into its own depression, where Germany goes from poor to even poorer. Okay, Germany goes into its own Great Depression as well. So, Germany is politically and economically unstable. Politically unstable, remember for the, the word unstable means it's not stable, it's not solid, it's not doing well. Politically unstable because the Weimar Republic, the new democratic government, is making awful decisions for Germany. And economically unstable is because they're in the depression, the money is worthless for them. Germans complain about the Weimar Republic and their decisions, and they want a new government instead, because this Weimar Republic is doing nothing for them, okay? They ask for a new government, and they um, actually support what's called fascism. This word over here is pronounced as fascism. Say it with me, because you're going to be saying it a lot. Fascism. Fascism is a dictator who controls with extreme nationalism, okay? Remember, a dictator is one person with all the power, so we have a, one person controlling the country using extreme nationalism. And remember, nationalism is a group of people with pride in their own country. So we now have, because Germany is in this Great Depression and doesn't like the Weimar Republic, they're going to ask for a fascist leader, someone who's going to control and promise to bring back German glory and make Germany great again. Adolf Hitler, the very name synonymous with power and might, had his destiny shaped by the early experiences in his life. Born in 1889 in a small village in Austria, Hitler's early days were anything but extraordinary. They were marked with poverty and struggle. Hitler wanted to be an artist, but on his father's insistence, he took up technical education, causing him to become rebellious at school. His next few years were spent penniless in the streets of Vienna as he struggled to pursue his dream of being a painter. However, enrolling for the German army during the First World War ignited in him a spirit of patriotism. 
He was twice recognized with the Iron Cross Medal for his bravery at the war front. Germany's defeat in the First World War and the unfair Versailles Treaty that followed infuriated Hitler. Carrying the angst, in 1919, he joined the German Workers' Party but soon took over and renamed it the National Socialist German Workers' Party. This popularly came to be known as the Nazi Party. The Nazi ideology, as propagated by Hitler, was based on a racial hierarchy that considered the German Aryans to be superior to the Jews. Soon, under Hitler's leadership, the Nazi party rose in significance, but it still failed to garner popular support. Hitler made a failed attempt to seize control of Bavaria in 1923, for which he was arrested and even tried for treason, though he was released later. It was during this period of imprisonment that he wrote Mein Kampf, that inspired German militarism and gave insights into his political ideology. Let's go back in time to see how Hitler skillfully took forward the Nazi party. The Nazi party saw a marked rise in its acceptance during the Great Depression. Inspired with the Nazi propaganda, thousands carried the red banners with the swastika in a hope for a better tomorrow. Massive rallies and public meetings helped to ignite the spirit of unity. Hitler's powerful speeches further motivated the people. And mir insbesonders, dass wir intolerante, unverträgliche Menschen sein. Wir wollten, sagen Sie, mit anderen Parteien nicht arbeiten. Und ein nationaler Politiker verschärft das noch, indem er sagt, die Nationalsozialisten sind überhaupt nicht deutsch, denn sie lehnen die Arbeit mit anderen Parteien ab. Also ist es typisch deutsch, 30 Parteien zu besitzen. Ich habe hier eine so erlehren, die Herren haben ganz recht. Wir sind intolerant. Ich habe mir ein Ziel gestellt, nämlich die 30 Parteien aus Deutschland hinauszufegen. Hitler's passion was reflected in his electrifying speeches. Soon, the Nazi party's share of votes rose from a measly 2.6% in 1928 to 37% in 1932, making it the largest party. Thus, Hitler had caught the imagination of the young German minds, promising them a Germany free of foreign influences. Hitler was seen as a messiah who would deliver people from all the ills prevalent in those times. Hitler's power compelled an initially hesitant President Hindenburg to offer him the chancellorship, the highest position in the cabinet of ministers. Very soon, Hitler took advantage of the situation when a mysterious fire broke out in the German parliament building and assumed greater control. He used his powers to send opponents such as communists to inhuman concentration camps, shut down trade unions and banned all political parties except his own. Within a month, Hitler also ensured that the Enabling Act was passed on March 3rd, 1933. This act gave Hitler the powers to sideline the parliament and rule by decree. Thus, through powerful speeches and shrewd planning, Hitler finally established dictatorship in Germany. Nature of Nazi ideology. So when we talk about Nazi ideology, we're talking primarily about what the Nazi party believed and how they projected these beliefs onto the population. To make this lovely and well-structured for us, we're going to divide it up into four key areas. Political ideology, economic ideology, 
military ideology and social ideology, which we might as well call racial ideology. Let's kick off with what the Nazis believed about politics, so their political ideology. The Nazi regime's political ideology was first and foremost a nationalist ideology. The Nazis believed in holding up the ideals of a great and powerful German nation. We'll get to their racial supremacy later, but it's important to remember that the Nazis also held up a national supremacy and believed Germany to be a superior country in many ways. Nazi political ideology is a biggie, so let's talk about its three key aspects. The rejection of internationalism, the Führer Prinzip, and its aggressive foreign policy. So we know that the Nazis were hugely bitter about the crippling terms of the Treaty of Versailles and their effects on the German population. A primary political goal of theirs was actually to get rid of the Treaty of Versailles altogether, or abolish it, and therefore get rid of the terms and agreements that came with it such as the League of Nations. The Nazis rejected the outward-looking international perspective of the League and by extension of the countries who led the League, mainly the UK and France. And historians call this political stance a rejection of internationalism. Basically, Nazi Germany was majorly bitter about the Treaty of Versailles and the internationalist ideology which accompanied it. Instead, they looked inward to their own national interests and rejected all efforts for peaceful diplomacy and cooperation. Secondly, because Nazi Germany totally rejected democracy, their political ideology became centred on Hitler as the single source of power. Historians call this ideology the Führer Prinzip, which is like the Führer's Principle. And this is the belief that, as Führer, Hitler was the supreme leader who encapsulated the spirit of the nation and controlled all areas of the regime. Basically, the strong leader, the Führer, was seen as the cornerstone of the Nazi political system, and Hitler's single-handed subordination of the population and government characterises much of the Nazi political ideology. Lastly, let's chat about aggressive foreign policy as another important part of the Nazi political ideology. Even though they were inward-looking and rejected internationalism, as we said, the Nazi government still needed to deal with some foreign affairs. They were aggressively negative about the whole ordeal. They pulled out of as many international agreements and treaties as they could and only signed treaties with those nations they needed to protect their national interests and strategically set themselves up to win the war that Hitler was cooking up. So this is mainly the Rome-Berlin Axis signed with Mussolini's Italy in 1936 and the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, or Soviet Nazi Non-Aggression Pact, signed with Stalin's USSR in 1939 which Hitler subsequently broke two years later, proving just how focused his foreign policy was on his own interests. Okay, cool. So, political ideology is the biggest aspect of the Nazi ideology as a whole, and this basically involves the Nazi party's beliefs about putting national interests over internationalism, replacing democracy with the figure of the Führer as the supreme authority, and carrying out an aggressive foreign policy. Next up, we have economic ideology. The economic ideology of the Nazi party can be boiled down to one really key concept called autarky. Autarky is a German word which basically translates to national self-sufficiency. This was the belief that the Nazi nation should be entirely economically self-sufficient. So, remembering what a sucky economic position they were in after World War I, Nazi Germany dreamed of restoring their economy to the point where they could stop depending on other countries to support their economy. Remember all that stuff about focusing on national interests and rejecting internationalism? Autarky is really just the economic part of that same idea. So essentially, the Nazi economic ideology was focused on the concept of autarky, or economic self-sufficiency. And now for military ideology. If you know much about World War II, you'll know that the Nazis were pretty keen on snapping up European territory. This falls under yet another funky German word, Lebensraum. This translates to something like living space. Not to be confused with a living room, living space refers to the Nazi belief that the German nation, and indeed the Aryan race, needed to expand to exercise its superiority. 
So the Nazi military ideology was expansionist. They wanted to take over or annex other countries and incorporate that territory into their nation. To be able to carry this out, the military also needed to be significantly extended, highly trained and equipped with weaponry, which Hitler prioritised. A clear example of Nazi military expansionism is an event called the Anschluss in 1938, which was when the Nazis annexed their neighbouring German-speaking country of Austria, incorporating all of Austrian territory into Nazi Germany. So to summarise, the Nazi military ideology was underpinned by the concept of Lebensraum, meaning living space, the belief that the German nation needed to expand to fulfil their national destiny, which required a strengthened and well-equipped military. And finally, last but not least, social ideology. The Nazi regime's social ideology was entirely based around their warped views on race, which is why we might as well call it a racial ideology. To help us out with this one, let's look at a really disturbing concept called social Darwinism, which the Nazis were fond of. Social Darwinism promoted an evolutionary view of race. So, based on Charles Darwin's theories of evolution, this concept sees the Aryan race as the most evolved and therefore the most superior of all the races. As I'm sure you can imagine, the Jewish race fell very low on this evolutionary scale. While of course now discredited by scientists as absolute nonsense, in the Nazi regime, this theory was used to justify and legitimate their state-enforced racist beliefs and actions. So the superiority of the Aryan race, which was made legitimate by this theory of social Darwinism, was also emphasised through Hitler's movement to unite all racially pure German people together as the People's Community of Germany. There were calls for these ancestral Germans to return home to their motherland at the same time that policies of ghettoization, clearing and eventually extermination were removing those minority groups deemed inferior from the population. These extensive efforts of ethnic cleansing were masked by propaganda campaigns which totally enforced this view of the destined racially pure Germany. So with all of that heaviness, that's a wrap. In this video, we saw how Nazi political beliefs centred around rejecting the international community, obsessing over the central Führer, and being aggressive in foreign affairs. Economic beliefs were focused on the concept of autarky, or economic self-sufficiency. Military ideology was all about expanding the Nazi state out across Europe and building up a strong military force to be able to do so. And finally, social or racial ideology was underpinned by social Darwinism, which saw the Aryan race as the most evolved and therefore superior race. And this ideology called for the people's community of pure Germans to come back to the motherland and modern parallels totally unintended, make Germany great again. Good luck getting some solid study notes together on all of that, and I'll catch you next time.